Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you very much for attending our session this uh, morning or afternoon or whatever time it happens to be where you are. Um, my name is Mark Thorin. I am a systems design engineer with Analog Devices System Development Group. Uh, my colleague, Brandon Bushy, will be around for the Q&A after the session here. Uh, the title of our session is Connected Analog Instrumentation with the Raspberry Pi. And we'll get our little pointer here and we'll get started. Okay, so first, uh, some thoughts on the motivation behind this presentation and why Analog Devices is so interested in using the Raspberry Pi. And it really boils down to bridging gaps between skill sets. And what I mean by that is uh, giving a hardware engineer or a mixed signal engineer the ability to take advantage of Linux infrastructure, Linux device drivers, and all of the flexibility and niceties that come along with a Linux-based system. Um, and on the hardware side of things, using standard hardware to allow software developers to write device drivers, debug software examples, without having to worry about hardware construction, without having to worry about signal integrity or power integrity issues. Um, using a common platform like Raspberry Pi and this little adapter board here allows us to replicate systems on opposite corners of the globe very easily and have confidence that the hardware is, um, is similar and matches up. Um, it takes a lot of different skill sets to design complicated systems and, uh, and complicated boxes like kernel developers or power application engineers, data converter application engineers. We want all of these people to be on the same page, both in terms of software and in terms of software uh, in, and in terms of hardware. Um, and then I've got another skill set here, hacker slash basic example developer, and that is where your presenter at the moment skill set squarely lies. Um, and we'll leave off with a couple of bold statements here that life is too short to fight with flaky hardware. Um, when I'm working with these sorts of things, I like to bolt everything together whenever possible, use robust connectors so that I don't have to worry about things coming apart when I'm working on them. Um, and similarly, on the software side, life is too short to fight with ad hoc software. So as a hardware guy, I can write myself a little hack together driver to talk to a data converter, but I don't trust it fully, and I certainly want, wouldn't want to put it into a customer's hands. And using a using a, a mainline Linux kernel driver is a way for me to develop applications in a way that I can pass them to my to my customer with confidence. So, um, what did things look like before analog devices started looking at the Raspberry Pi? So I, uh, I actually joined Analog Devices uh, through the Linear Technology merger. And when that was announced, I spent uh, quite a bit of time um, looking over various uh, website, various pages on the Analog Devices wiki uh, to try to get a feel for how they were doing their software and driver support. And I came across a lot of uh, pages that had pictures like this on it. So very detailed description of a software driver followed by setup and, an, and a piece of example code. And then, well, what hardware setup did we use? This was typically all that was shown, was the evaluation board connected up to some random Linux platform. And for a Linux developer, that's not a big deal. Just grab the source code, cross compile to whatever platform you happen to have in front of you, and you're off and running. Uh, but for a hardware guy, that is uh, a little. That's a, a pretty daunting task. Um, it involves a lot of a lot of skills that uh, that we don't necessarily have. So um, you can see already that um, some commonality would be a big advantage here. Um, a just a, a little related comment here that a lot of these early drivers were done in user space, which is very flexible. Um, you can do whatever you want, but of course there's no standard and no reuse and no peer review. Um, so most of what we'll be talking about today or all of it, I should say, are uh, proper kernel space drivers uh, for performance reasons and for the requisite peer review required for upstreaming. Um, and this, uh, this link is to the page where I think I got this middle photograph from. <laughs> 
Okay, so when did the Raspberry Pi start to enter the picture? So I kept digging and digging and eventually came across this example. Uh, the wiki page for this is dated 2012. So what is that, eight years ago? And uh, I was even playing with the first Raspberry Pi at that time. I forget exactly what I was doing with this, but it seemed like a neat thing and that I, I might want to have one on my, my workbench here. Um, and this example was for the ADXL 345. So first instance that I could find where, uh, where we're using a Raspberry Pi for um, showing off a um, for showing off a device, an accelerometer in this case. So why Raspberry Pi? Why not one of those other platforms in, from those previous pictures there? So this is uh, generally not a good thing to say to a kid, um, but in our case, it's perfectly appropriate to say because all your friends are doing it. Uh, this chart is from the EE Times Embedded Market Survey, which is a fantastic document um, for sort of getting a feel for what hardware and software environments uh, your customers and your colleagues are using. And so if we look at what boards uh what, what boards are being used in industry. Um, of course, uh, complicated custom designs require custom platforms, which is the most prevalent, uh, other proprietary designs. And then the first common platform that pops up is Arduino, which is uh, just amazing for how simple and cheap they are. Um, they're, they're, and, and probably that's why they're so popular is because there's such a, uh, uh, su such a rich sort of maker space um, movement behind it. Um, but of course, Arduino is not a is not appropriate for Linux based systems. Uh, the first platform that does show up is Raspberry Pi. And so you know, 16 17% of, uh, of those surveyed were using the Raspberry Pi, um, followed by things like Nucleo and uh, BeagleBone down here as well. So Raspberry Pi, very popular, um, very sort of rich uh, community support. So um, that is a, a natural choice for us to use for, uh, for our development. And so that begs the question, why not just use a PC? Um, a Raspberry Pi is just a little baby computer. I can run Linux on a PC. Uh, and the answer there is because of the interfaces that, uh, that it provides. So uh, a PC will typically have... USB ports, uh, HDMI ports, things like that, but nothing really appropriate for direct connection to an integrated circuit device that would typically have an I2C interface or serial peripheral interface or SPI, uh, whereas the Raspberry Pi has a uh, direct connection to all of those interfaces there. And just a little uh, photograph here, um, wondering if anyone, any of the attendees here have had the pleasure or displeasure of writing a device driver in quotes to bit bang signals on a PC's parallel port or even a serial port. Uh, when I joined Linear Technology, there were quite a few um, quite a few demo boards that used serial and parallel ports, uh, often with software that writes directly to the hardware registers. Um, so that was around about uh, 2000 timeframe or so. Uh, that did work, uh, but of course it's, it's not very robust and, and certainly not maintainable in the long run. Okay, so that's why we're using, that's why we're not using a, a PC. So that was the brief, brief look at the hardware. On the software side of things, the most, if not all, of the examples that we will be talking about here make use of the Linux IIO framework or Industrial Input Output Framework. And so this is a software framework for converter-ish devices. So not only analog to digital and di digital to analog converters, uh, but things like gyroscopes and accelerometers, uh, current monitoring devices, uh, light meters, and, and things of that nature. Devices that, that either produce or or consume discrete samples of data or streams of data, uh, time-sensitive streams of data. Um, and this slide purposely has no analog devices content on it. This is a uh, an industry standard. It's not an ADI standard, although we were involved in its development and, and are involved in its maintenance. So a little screenshot here from kernel.org uh, showing a couple of analog devices drivers, uh, as well as some drivers from our competitors and a little block diagram of a typical IIO subsystem. And this is from ST Micro. So again, any work that you put into working through the examples we'll show here. Uh, of course, we'd love for you to use analog devices parts, but it also carries over to other, other parts uh, within the industry from other manufacturers.
Okay, so associated with IIO, a couple of other uh, terms and definitions here. So LibIIO is a software library or a software API to IIO type devices. So it's a, a native C library, but it does have bindings for uh, MATLAB and C Sharp. Uh, I believe there's also, um, there, there's definitely Python, uh, even LabVIEW and uh, GNU Radio as well. So it's it's a very cross-platform, cross-language library that's, that's quite flexible. Um, IIOD is a little program, and I guess we'll flip over to this block diagram here. This is a program that reflects IIO devices from a hardware platform over a network interface. And this is really useful for both debug and developing application software. So this allows us, in the case of uh, this diagram here, I can have some devices, some data converters that are connected to my Raspberry Pi, and I don't have to run any software on my Raspberry Pi. I can do all my development in a comfortable in, in a comfortable IDE on my Windows or Mac or Linux box, and I can talk to that converter device as if I were running locally. Um, and then this can actually be deployed in production. So you may have a case where you've got a hardware device that always has application software running on uh, a remote machine, uh, or you might have a little client application that does run on the Raspberry Pi. So picture a data logger where the Raspberry Pi is out in the middle of nowhere collecting temperature or pressure samples or something like that. My application software might just read those samples and dump them to an SD card or, or something like that. So it's uh, it, it's it's a quite a flexible, uh, it, it, it provides flexibility in how you communicate and connect with your devices. Uh, client application uh, fairly straightforward. It's it's w whatever. It's uh, it's it's your your end application thing, um, and I, I guess I, the IIOD server is an example of a client application. Um, and then if your client application is written in Python or if you're developing in Python, we'll we'll talk in a little bit about uh, a software library called PyADI IIO, or affectionately called PyOD. Okay, so sort of a 30,000 foot or a 10,000 meter look at the hardware setup, a typical hardware setup would, of course, involve a Raspberry Pi with some hardware connection to a, uh, to, uh, to a data converter-ish device, in, in this case, an AD7124, uh, <clears throat> which is an ADC. Uh, and then the Raspberry Pi, maybe I don't run any software locally, but if it's running this IIOD server, then I can connect to my remote PC over sort of any any Ethernet connection or any network connection, whether it's wireless or wired, uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, and I can develop like this. I can um, I, I can write code using libio on this machine and talk to my end device here. Um, if I want to generate test signals for my hardware, I might use something like the ADALM2000. This is a little uh, oscilloscope slash signal generator, digital digital pattern generator slash uh, uh, logic analyzer device. So uh, quite flexible. I can use it to generate test signals for my analog to digital converter, or I can use it to read signals from an analog to digital converter. So on this slide, I've got basically a fully functional workbench for developing mixed signal applications. And of course, the Raspberry Pi is a full-blown computer all by itself, so I can get rid of that external computer entirely. Um, I can develop software on the Raspberry Pi. Um, I do a lot of work in Python, and there's a super cute little IDE called Thani that ships with most uh, Raspbian distributions. And so that is perfectly appropriate for developing simple application code. Uh, and this, the ADALM2000 will also interface directly to the Raspberry Pi. So I can get rid of that client computer entirely and do everything on my Pi. Okay, so what distribution should we run on our Raspberry Pi? So Raspbian is sort of the, the standard distribution that most people get started with on Raspberry Pi. And, and we're, we're no different. We, uh, we started out doing our initial development with Raspberry Pi on Raspbian. Um, but it didn't take too long before we realized that, hey, there's an awful lot of other stuff we have to load onto, the, load onto Raspbian in order for it to, um, to do the job for us. Uh, so we started a project called ADI Kuiper Linux. And so this is a 
a, a fork of Raspbian that uh, we're developing. And what it has is all appropriate Linux device drivers for all analog devices and linear technology parts. They're all enabled in the kernel. Um, so if I if I get a new part and it has a, a Linux driver, I don't have to go through that trouble of, of recompiling the kernel. Again, not a big deal for a software guru. It's a big deal for a guy like me. Um, and let's see, so we've got the kernel recompiled. Uh, along with that, we also found that there were a lot of software libraries that we would have to go in and, and rebuild and reinstall every time. Uh, so we've we've built that into the distribution. So this is libIIO along with its Python bindings, along with its C bindings. Uh, libm2k is a library for communicating with this little as multifunctional instruments uh, and PyADI IIO or PyOD. So the, the Python interface to IIO devices is also included. Uh, we've also got GNU Radio. So if you want to play around with some uh, communication applications, then uh, that's that's built into the distribution. Uh, IIO Oscilloscope is a little debug tool that's super useful for uh, for most of this stuff as well. Um, documentation and instructions are up on wiki.analog.com, and of course this is fully open. So we are not going to enable drivers for our competitors' parts, but there's nothing stopping you from uh, building your own distribution that does include support for those devices. Okay, let's let's uh, head head towards an experiment here. So um, the first example we'll look at is a connected AD7124 24-bit Sigma Delta converter. And in fact, I've got the converter up here as well. And so what our objective here is to start taking readings from this converter so that we can start developing application full applications, whether it's a voltmeter or a thermocouple meter uh, or a barometric pressure meter or, or something like that. So um, the hardware connections are quite straightforward. It's the Raspberry Pi with either jumper wires uh, or even or an adapter like this little uh, adapter from Digilent here. So it's a very simple software setup. And our first test signal for this and a very useful first test signal for any A to D converter is either a short circuit or or a very small input voltage. So in our case, we have a, what is this, a, a 200 to one divider. Um, so we, we impose just a, a couple of millivolt signal across our first analog input channel. And so that gives us something to look at. Um, in the old days with a 12 bit converter, we would expect to see like no codes of flicker, either zero or one or some small number of codes. Uh, but with something like a 24 bit Sigma Delta, we always expect to see some level of noise at the input. Um, it, because our quantization noise is so low. And so let's start digging in and take a look at that. Oh, uh, but first we'll talk about the, the software interface. So um, we are going to, we're going to talk to our converter through Python, through this PyOD or PyADI IIO interface. And just a, this description from the readme on the on, uh, on GitHub really says it all. It, it's a Python abstraction module for ADI hardware to make them easier to use. So libIIO is actually not that hard to use, but there's a lot of boilerplate. There's um, establishing communication with your part, uh, setting up channels and, and things of that nature. And uh, PyADI IIO just, just takes care of that. And there's an example of that shown over here to the right. Um, so the AD9361 is a highly sophisticated software defined radio chip. And um, to grab a chunk of data from that device through PyOD is three lines of code. We import the library, we instantiate the device, and then we pull data out of it. Uh, of course, there's a lot of knobs to tweak and, and a lot of settings to change uh, as well to get it to operate exactly how you want to, uh, but, but fundamentally connecting to it and, and getting to hello world is three lines of code, uh, not counting comments. Um, and of course, this is pre-installed on ADI Kuiper Linux, and it's um, available through uh, uh, PyPy and Conda as well. So this is um, uh, it's, it's very easy to install. And so for the AD7124, this precise low-speed um, precision converter, this is what that interface looks like. And let's dwell on this for a little bit. So um, the first thing we do, of course, is open import our library. Uh, then we establish a connection to the device. So I instantiate an instance of an AD7124, and the IIO 
the IIO context, I open in this case uh, as an IP address. So it looks like what I was doing here, this code was actually running on my remote Windows computer and the 7124 was connected to my Raspberry Pi either across my lab or, or maybe in the office or, or across the world, it doesn't really matter, um, as long as I have a network connection to it. Um, and what I put here can vary depending on where you are. I can give it, if I want to talk locally, if I'm running this code on the Raspberry Pi, then I can, can tell it to connect to the local backend, uh, or I can tell it to connect to localhost. So that still communicates through the IIO daemon, uh, but it's local, it, it never leaves the machine. And this is super useful if you don't have uh, root privileges, uh, because you, you can read from any of these devices, but writing requires root privileges. Um, so talking through localhost is a, uh, is a, a nice way of, of doing that. Um, and then reading data and configuring the part is, um, again, super simple. So uh, this part has a built-in programmable gain amplifier. Um, so we, we set the gain in our case to its minimum value. Uh, and then it also has a variable oversample ratio. So I can adjust the speed and noise level of the converter as well. So in this case, I'm setting it to 128 samples per second. Um, I can read a single raw value of data, or I can read some number of buffered data points. So continuous data points taken from the converter uh, if I'd like to analyze a waveform rather than collect a single sample from a temperature sensor or something like that. Uh, and, and I'll make the point here is that I set a really long timeout for this because this converter is very slow. It's very slow, but also very low noise. Uh, and finally, just like with the software-defined radio chip, I collect my data. Okay, and, and here's what the output of that script looks like, or, or what the output of that, uh, that converter looks like. So here is an example that takes 1,024 samples from that circuit that we had set up. So a very small input voltage. We expect to see nothing but a small offset plus the noise of the data converter itself. And so when I first wrote this script, um, I was all happy that I was getting data back from it. And I said, well, let's plot this and see what happens. And down here, this is the first set of data that I captured from this thing. It wandered all over the place. And of course, I think to myself, you know, what went wrong is do I have a hardware issue? Is something all messed up um, or, or am I on the right track? And, you know, then it dawned on me that, hey, this thing is still warming up. So when you first apply power to a 24-bit segment, delta. Uh, the sigma delta itself, as well as its internal reference, everything is warming up and coming in and, and, and stabilizing thermally. And so I let it sit for a few minutes and eventually things start to calm down a little bit, but still wandering a bit. And so finally, I wrapped it up in anti-static bubble wrap and just let it sit for a couple hours. And then I start to approach data sheet noise levels. And that's what's shown down here. So if I take that data set, take the standard deviation, I get a number that matches up very nicely to the noise number in the data sheet of the 7124. So the point of this is, with a very simple hardware setup and a very simple software setup enabled by the Raspberry Pi, I can start measuring the performance of this, this really high-tech converter, and I'm all set up to go in and develop useful applications. So it, it's not a stretch to go from, uh, to go from this script to taking in a voltage from a thermocouple, applying a polynomial, calculating temperature, or taking a small voltage from a strain gauge and calculating force. So I've, I've really, not only do am I set up for application development, but I can also really go in and make sure that the thing is, is meeting its data sheet specs all very, very easily. Okay, so let's talk about going the other direction. So that was a 24-bit analog to digital converter. Uh, so another example of some connected analog is this uh, circuit note 531 that is in development. And this is a one part per million linear digital to analog converter. And what's shown in this plot here is the departure from a perfect straight line. So uh, in other words, I'm creating an output voltage from negative five volts to positive five volts counting one count at a time and uh, I expect to see a I expect to see a perfectly straight line the departure from that line is on the order of one part per million so this is this is the error in that line exaggerated quite a bit here 
Um, so again, now I have the ability to generate extremely precise DC voltages. So if I was building a uh, piece of test equipment like a sensor calibrator or something of that nature, or even a uh, just a precision voltage box, um, I've now got the ability to do that very, very easily. And of course, this plugs into that same adapter that we're using here. So super easy to connect up with um, when you're using standard hardware platforms. Okay, and uh, it, it doesn't stop there. So um, there's quite a few parts that are either released already, um, I should say parts with little modules like this that are either in development or released already. Um, even if not, it's still fairly straightforward to wire a Raspberry Pi up to some other evaluation board. Just keep your wires short, uh, keep everything grounded well, and, and you're set up for success. Uh, but some examples here are this, uh, this uh, ADXRS290 gyroscope. Uh, we've got the AD5593 here, which is a little eight channel, uh, eight channels of D to A, eight channels of A to D, uh, as well as digital GPIO. So a really flexible part for uh, tweaking voltages uh, across a, a large uh, system board of some sort. Um, and one thing worth mentioning is that we are working on porting, uh, working on a variant of IIO that runs on embedded targets. Uh, so that is called Tiny IIOD. And uh, the idea there is, um, if I'm w what that does for us is, if I'm developing for an embedded application, I can have two versions of my target. I can have a Raspberry Pi Linux-based version and a uh, and an embedded version. I can develop software on my remote host, and and it doesn't know the difference. So again, just another um, another tool in our toolbox for developing software, developing applications, both hardware and software. Okay, so let's move away from small, cute, and uh, precise onto some higher speed stuff here. And the example that we'll talk about is a signal generator, like a, a radio frequency signal generator. So this is something that you might use in a communication setup uh, to generate a, a like a local oscillator signal for a radio application uh, or an actual radio signal. So maybe I generate a tone at a gigahertz and, and modulate the amplitude or modulate the frequency. Um, so super handy device. Uh, they show up in labs all over the place here. Um, they also get in, integrated into um, in, into capital test equipment. So if I'm like analog devices is an IC manufacturer, uh, our test setup might involve a stack of these signal generators in a, a 19 inch rack setup of some sort here. Um, so, you know, the, the, the point being is that, you know, signal generator has lots of different use cases. They show up everywhere. And of course, um, analog devices doesn't traditionally make boxes like this. Uh, we make enabling technology that goes into these boxes. Um, so what you're paying for when you buy a box like this is the user interface, the software interface, and, and more often than not protection. So this thing, th these tend to be an awful lot more robust than just an integrated circuit on a, on a circuit board there. So it's about the packaging. So how are we going to enable companies that make boxes like this to play with our parts quickly and easily? Um, and I guess a, a, a follow on to that is how, how would we enable someone to that was building a, a, a test setup to build a minimal test setup without having to go and purchase a full blown benchtop signal generator? And um, here's an example of a device that can do that uh, in some cases, this AD9166. So this is a DC to 9 gigahertz vector signal generator. Um, so it's actually, a, uh, it has a digital to analog converter core. Uh, it has a very high speed uh, JSD204B data interface for baseband modulation data. Uh, but it also has internal numerically controlled oscillators. So at the price point for this for this part for this DAC, um, it actually makes sense to put it down on a board and just leave the data interface disconnected. So don't bother sending any data to it. Just use it as a sine wave generator, and and that's exactly what we're doing with uh, the Circuit Note 511, and uh, we are using a Raspberry Pi to control it. And so here's what that looks like in, in real life. So it's a, a Raspberry Pi hat form factor board uh, with a clocking solution, the DAC itself, and again, it has a very wide, very high speed JSD 204B converter interface that is completely disconnected on this board. It's just dangling in the breeze. 
Um, but we, we do communicate with all these devices through the Raspberry Pi's spy port. Um, and again, you can control it locally if you connect a, a HDMI monitor slash USB connector. And, and that's, what, uh, that's what we're showing over here. Um, and of course, it's running ADI Kuiper Linux. Uh, and of course, all of the drivers for these devices are built into the Kuiper Linux kernel. Um, the PLL driver is mainlined, and the AD9166 driver, uh, the upstreaming process, the upstreaming is in process. Okay, so another shot of the hardware setup, a little close up here. So we've got the DAC, and uh, this is not a low power part. Uh, it dissipates a few watts uh, when it's running at full speed here, so it requires a heat sink. And um, this is that this is the IIO oscilloscope interface to that part. So again, this is a this is a simple GUI. The objective of this GUI is not it's not really an end application. It's something to allow you to quickly and easily diddle knobs um, what, once you get your hardware all set up. So it's basically great for signs of life. And you can see that we can enter in a sampling frequency uh, and then what output frequency do we want as well and um, enable and disable the output. Okay, so once you get bored with the, um, once you get bored with the GUI, because um, it's not fun to sit there and poke buttons all afternoon, um, of course, you can flip over to a uh, controlling things programmatically. So here, you know, again, we're using that uh, Pyote interface to connect to our CN511 device. Um, we set up our sample clock, we set up our output frequency. So now we have the ability to control this thing programmatically. So, you know, very powerful, powerful in a benchtop environment, even more powerful in an automated test environment where I basically have to control everything programmatically. So another example of this, so um, taking a step back into the, the slow, uh, powerful world here is the uh, Circuit Note 508. So this is a digitized uh, power supply. And in fact, it uses the AD7124 ADC to measure all kinds of stuff. We measure the, um, looking at the, uh, looking at the diagram here. We use that converter to measure the temperature of the onboard voltage regulators. Uh, we measure input voltages, output voltages, output current. Um, basically, everything that can be measured is measured with the AD7124. Uh, and the output voltage is controlled with a 16-bit D to A converter. So again, a super flexible 75-watt uh, power supply, and it's all controlled by a Raspberry Pi Zero. Okay, so we mentioned uh, earlier on that we're using the Raspberry Pi because of its because of the physical interfaces it provides: the SPI interface, the I squared C interface, and uh, uh, parallel GPIO. Um, so what happens? So so where where do we run into the where, where's the Raspberry Pi? Where does it become a limiting factor? And it becomes a limiting factor as our data interfaces grow in speed, uh, grow in width, um, and where timing requirements kick in. And so um, once you re once you reach that point, then you basically have to go to a programmable logic solution of some sort. And the ADALM Pluto is a perfect example of that. So this is a this is a a software-defined radio uh, transceiver chip that is basically connected up to a Zinc FPGA. Um, there is not a lot of signal processing going on in the in the Zinc FPGA, so this just serves to swallow the data from the AD9363 or send data to it. Um, it manages data transfer between Linux user space and and the uh, the FPGA, and eventually to the, the transceiver chip itself. And it provides that same clean IIO interface back to a host PC. Um, and I'll make a point here. Um, we, we, we've said several times that the, the Raspberry Pi has spy interfaces on it. Um, Beware of that term. There are lots of data converters that say SPI very prominently on the front page of the data sheet, um, but the Raspberry Pi does not do precise timing. So even at a few thousand samples per second, you're going to have trouble maintaining tight timing, uh, which, which impacts your analog performance at, at some point. Um, so just something to be aware of here. Um, and then the final thought on, on this page is that, you know, this, th this is not a Raspberry Pi, but boy, the software interface looks very, very similar to everything that we've talked about so far.
Okay, but that doesn't mean that the Raspberry Pi uh, isn't a little bit useful for in applications like this. And so this is a uh, this is an example that we put together for the uh, for the GRCon conference this year, and it is an AM radio to FM radio translator. So we we're again we're using the ADALM Pluto that device that we sh showed on the previous board, and the ADALM2000, so the same device that we use to generate signals for our low-speed converter, we're using the ADALM2000 to actually digitize a signal at 455 kilohertz. So we digitize at a, at a high rate. We do all of that high-speed processing or, or high-speed data capture in programmable logic, uh, and then we transfer that to our Raspberry Pi over USB. We do some processing, and then we send it back out to our ADALM Pluto. So again, the reason we're using Raspberry Pi here is because, because it's convenient. You could use a Linux box, but we've included GNU Radio and interfaces to both the M2K and the Pluto um, along with ADI Kuiper Linux. So all of the, all the software tools are, are built in. And here is what this crazy thing looks like in real life. So uh, we've got an AM radio um, educational kit here. We are sniffing, we're picking off the intermediate frequency. Uh, we are digitizing that with our ADALM2000. We bring that into our Raspberry Pi 4 in this case, where we do our processing, send out to modulate the baseband data as FM and send out to our ADALM Pluto. So again, making full, everything is doing is doing what it does best. So, um, and, and, and of course the Raspberry Pi is doing, is doing the processing. So we send out and uh, we're using a little Hello Kitty FM radio to uh, receive our tone back. And this is up on our, um, on our uh, uh, GRCon uh, GitHub page there, uh, this example. So we can provide links out to this if, if anyone finds this interesting. Okay, so um, this, uh, hopefully it sounded like a lot of fun. Uh, it certainly was fun putting together this presentation and developing these examples. Um, there are a couple of uh, publicly available uh, tutorials and, and walkthroughs here. Uh, the first one is called, we call it the IIO Intro Toolbox, Toolbox and Tutorial. And uh, this is actually the hardware associated with that tutorial. Um, so it goes through the process of, um, of hooking up an ADXL345 accelerometer to a Raspberry Pi, uh, configuring device trees, bringing up Python, communicating with the device. So it's, it's really a great um, sort of a boot camp for all of these topics. Uh, the AD7124 Precision Lab, where we go through the, the noise analysis, that is the Precision ADC Toolbox, also up on wiki.analog.com. Um, and then finally, for a, a cheap non-analog devices example, there's a great tutorial that was one of the first ones that I followed um, on bringing up an LM75 temperature sensor. So this is a very common temperature sensor that's used on hard drives and motherboards and all that. Um, and so it's a, a very nice write-up on uh, bringing up that that parts driver and its device tree um, and I should point out that the LM75 driver is enabled in ADI Kuiper Linux I, I requested that one for for this uh, for this reason uh, and then finally a little reading material here uh, this is an article on ADI's uh, an ADI perspective on free and open source software um, especially things like uh, Linux and uh, and IIO Okay, so some acknowledgments here. So um, I was the, uh, your presenter this afternoon, but you know, really the, the real work was done by an awful lot of uh, uh, different folks out here. And the best way to give credit or the best way to see who that is, is to look at the contributors on, on GitHub, uh, in particular for uh, libio, Pyote, uh, ADI, Kypergen. Uh, and I'll point out uh, in particular, Mircea Caprioru, um, Kuiper Linux is, is his uh, blood, sweat, and tears here. He put a lot of time into that. Uh, Travis Collins developed uh, Pyote. Uh, the folks that developed the hardware here, uh, Mahai, Urbe, and Trisha. And uh, Adrian Suchu is the software manager uh, behind LibM2K. So all of these guys and girls are um, you know, very helpful They uh, and responsive on Engineer Zone and uh, as well as GitHub. Okay, and that's our presentation here. And I guess the uh, the final thought here is um, I really hope that this uh, event is in person in uh, 2021. It'd be great to run some hands-on workshops with this stuff. Okay, thank you very much.